Well, welcome to our City Rise podcast. Appreciate you joining us as we've moved into the video realm. And uh, today we've got a couple young ladies from Attack Poverty that have amazing stories and uh, just amazing ministry to share with us. So welcome, Jenny and Rachel. Just take a minute, tell us about yourself, and uh, we'll, we'll jump in and hear more about Attack Poverty. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having us. First mm-hmm. of all, we're really excited to be here. Um, so yeah. So my name is Jenny Jones. Um, I'm the senior director of programs at Attack Poverty. Um, so I get the amazing opportunity of um, leading a team um, that Rachel serves on mm-hmm. as well um, in our program department. So I get to oversee the strategic thinking implementations and even um, accountability and excellence, which I'm sure Rachel mm-hmm. hit on here in a little bit of our programs throughout our locations. Um, so we have three locations throughout the city of Houston, um, and then we currently have four international locations wow. as well. Super. Yeah, as Jenny said, um, I get to work really closely with her every day as the director of program excellence. Um, but what that really means is really just making sure that our the programs that we implement are connecting back to our mission and vision and really making sure that we are moving people along this continuum of surviving to thriving and breaking that generational poverty. Super. All right. Well, we had Brandon on here a couple years ago, so we kind of got the macro. We'll mm-hmm. fill in some of the blanks with with you guys and, uh, and I know recently I attended your gala, which mm-hmm. was pretty amazing. And I got to hear some of the international, which I didn't mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. But uh, just very brief history. Attack Poverty has been around a dozen years. Uh, tell us that. Yeah, so we just celebrated 11 years. Okay. Um, we really started with Uganda and mm-hmm. our friends of North Richmond, birthed out of the local church at River Point Church, mm-hmm. um, but really started with the passion of showing up to the communities around you instead of having to go overseas to reach that. And so five miles from River Point Church, um, we got invited into that community just mm-hmm. through community listening, and it's just flourished from there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So one of the things that we do obviously is we look specifically for communities that are under resourced. Um, and then we go into those communities and walk alongside community stakeholders and residents in that community to empower them to attack poverty in their individual lives, but in their community as a whole and empowering, um, individuals in their community and really linking arms and walking alongside is something that's really important to us. Um, And so we do that uh, by going into uh, under-resourced communities and resourcing them through four missional components, which is spiritual growth, um, education, revitalization, and basic needs. And so everything that we do programmatically um, on the micro level, like you were mentioning earlier, um, has to tie back to those four missional components and has to tie um, back to those four missional components really acting as a um, vehicle of empowerment in communities that we work in. So. All right. And when you go in, I've, I've visited a couple of your, I'm not sure the right language, serve centers or your your centers that are there. Uh-huh. So how many do you have? Where are they located? Yeah. So we um, have three in the Houston area. Um, we have two in Fort Bend County, one in Richmond, North Richmond specifically, mm-hmm. and then one in North Rosenberg. And then we have one, um, our North side location, uh, which is in the Lindale community, mm-hmm. which is honestly about like four to five miles away from downtown. Um, so that's actually housed inside of um, Ecclesia's campus, Lindale okay. campus. Wow. Um, but they have done an, a beautiful job of um, that campus serves uh, really as a community center to um, the community. And so there's several nonprofits that are housed in there. Attack Poverty's North Side location is one of them. Okay. Yeah. So you mentioned services. So just go across the uh, the menu there. Uh, I, some of them I know. I mean, you help with food distribution, these type of things. But what, what other type yeah. of interactions do you have? Yeah. So we can just start in spiritual growth real quick. Um, that really looks like putting or providing opportunities to put your faith into action. So that looks like prayer walks, um, devotionals, Um, But really coming around individuals of more like a small group Mm -hmm. of um, not specifically about prayer or reading the Bible, but we try to get creative in those ways. Education um, with our youth, we really focus on UK Academy, which I know we'll dive into Mm -hmm. in a second. And then adults ranges anywhere from GED to ESL to job and skill development to um, computer literacy, computer literacy and um, finances Mm -hmm. and things like that. Then we move into revitalization, which really looks like our home repair and um, really advocating for the community for sidewalks, streetlights, 
those types of things that the community really values. Um, community gardens is also in there that we really strive for. Um, and then lastly is basic needs. And that's really um, the disaster recovery portion right. of that home repair um, and just community repair and what that mm -hmm. looks like. And then food distributions, mental health and counseling. So we do a little bit of everything yeah. in there. <laughs> Healthcare. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, again, we'll have some pastors listening in on this. So how, how can they reach you? Yeah. So, yeah. So really probably going to our website mm -hmm. would be the best way um, to get a hold of us, uh, which is attackpoverty.org. Um, also, we're all over any social media platform as well. So that's a good way to get a hold of us too. Um, but I, so I, um, before I joined staff, the staff at Attack of Poverty, um, I was in pastoral ministry for 18 years. I was an executive pastor. Um, and so one of the ways, speaking to pastors that are going to be listening to this podcast, um, one of the ways that we invest in our missional component of spiritual growth as well is through our collaborative mm -hmm. partnerships, but yeah. specifically with churches. And so um, this morning I was in a meeting and uh, one of the things that I said in that meeting is that I would love for Attack Poverty mm -hmm. to be a one-stop shop for mm -hmm. pastors. When you're thinking mm -hmm. of how can I mobilize my church to be involved in advocating for and serving uh, the most vulnerable and marginalized in our community, I wanted them to think of attack poverty because so much of the work that we do um, could not happen if we did not have church partners that were helping with funding, but mobilizing volunteers as well. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Now, if someone on the other side of the spectrum, or maybe a friend uh, would say, hey, I've got a friend and uh, he needs a GED or mm -hmm. she needs support today. Uh, and I'm sure there are limits, uh, like you guys don't have overnight facilities as far as I know you can correct me but uh, how would they come through the same uh, website to connect with you guys mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. and then from there we would just really try to connect them either to a community resource that we have mm -hmm. or um, help them find the best resource for them sure yeah. okay now you mentioned funding uh, obviously you, you guys would take that any way you'd get it but, uh, <laughs> foundations churches individuals mm -hmm. uh, obviously we mentioned the gala but what are other uh, avenues there yeah, so all of the above of what yeah. you just mentioned and all of the above of what you just mentioned is part of our f current funding um, sure. plan as well. Um, but then also like, you know, we take in-kind gifts as mm -hmm. well, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we have, again, after-school tutoring program, for instance, UK and Academy, you know, so if anybody wanted, donated, you wanted to donate a semester of meals or snacks mm -hmm. for that, we mm -hmm. certainly would take that. We currently are on the hunt for a box truck mm -hmm. um, so that we can do a better job. So for instance, instance, um, coming up soon at one of our locations, we're going to be hosting um, our first ever farmer's market. Wow. So we teamed up with a gardener who has a six acre organic garden mm. and um, donates all of the food mm. to be distributed in the community. And so anyway, we are going to take that food and we're going to set up a free farmer's market in the parking lot of one of our locations um, because in this particular location is in a food desert. Mm -hmm. So that's not really food that type of food that a community has access to. However, the transportation of that food yeah. from the community garden to our location is problematic without having something like a box truck and that kind of stuff. So we're also looking for um, opportunities of, of like donation and in-kind mm -hmm. gifts and stuff like that as well. Super. Yeah. All yeah. Right. Well, listeners always love to hear stories. So I would love to hear one, two, where you could say, hey, we met this child, came through UCAN Academy, or it could be a neighbor or it could be disaster relief, where you could say two years, whatever, Fast forward, we've seen the Lord do this in her life or their life. Yeah, so I'll let you. Yeah, go first. so um, I've been talking about Manny a lot. So I'd love to share sure. a little bit about Manny. Um, so UCAN Academy is focused for first through fifth graders. Mm -hmm. And we really work with the school to identify the, the kids because at a Title I school, everyone could really benefit yeah. from extra support. And so, but we really work with the wraparound specialist or that counselor to really identify who would really get the most mm -hmm. benefit out of specifically reading and math support. And um, so Manny is now a fifth grader and he's one of the first students we've had actually complete all five years years of that. Mm -hmm. So we've really been able to see that tr what the transformation and impact that you can Academy can have. And I was having a conversation with him the other day and I was just like, tell me your favorite part about you can Academy. And he was like, well, you know, I, I get my homework done and I, I get time to do that. But he goes, what I really love is to help my, my classmates. Mm -hmm. And he, we've just seen him flourish from 
someone who who couldn't complete their homework on their own now to helping his mm -hmm. classmates, but not even on just a homework level. He was like, actually, it's from there I help them. But then we also have just built relationships. Yeah. So now you're seeing a support system just in elementary school students mm -hmm. being built that then right. transcends into after school and during school hours. And yeah. so he went on and on about just the relationships that he's been able to build. And then talking about compassion, other ways that he wants to see compassion come to life in yeah. his school and community. So wow. it was just so cool to see, yes, they are there for educational support, but as all of our programs are really holistically based, we see all of these other dimensions of flourishment mm -hmm. really come out from that. Sure. Yeah, and to piggyback on that, uh, story of Manny um, at our most recent school board meeting or the mm. school district that he's in, um, he uh, led the Pledge of Allegiance mm -hmm. to open that. Um, and so to think of, um, you know, we oftentimes see kiddos come into UCAN Academy um, not able to have confidence to even make mm -hmm. eye contact, mm -hmm. definitely not to raise their hand to ask, to answer a question or to, or to volunteer to pray out loud or right. whatever mm -hmm. that may be to going to your leading the pledge of allegiance at a school board meeting. Um, it's a really beautiful thing mm -hmm. to watch. Another story that I think about, and this was shared, um, you know, at, at our gala, but mm -hmm. I just love this story is, um, Lupita, who's mm -hmm. one of our ESL students, um, at our North side location. So Lupita was very similar to Manny in the sense of when she started um, ESL class, uh, very quiet, very shy, um, not a lot of uh, confidence um, in herself or answering mm -hmm. and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and also very dependent, like a lot of adult um, English as a second language individuals, very dependent on her kids right. for translation. Right. So uh, COVID happens. Mm -hmm. And I think Lupita by that time had completed ESL one. Mm -hmm. um, I don't start ESL two yet, but anyway, COVID happens and she uh, needs to go and obtain uh, identification right. um, for other things, of course, needed in her life. Um, well, COVID, you can't bring somebody with you. And mm -hmm. so it was the first time in her life that she was going to have to navigate a situation like yeah. this without her daughter being able to translate for her. And um, so she's nervous and everything, but she gets there and as she's filling out the form, she realizes, I know the answer. To, I, mm -hmm. I First of all, I can read the question mm -hmm. and I know how to answer the question. And then yeah. as she starts having verbal conversation with the person at DPS, um, mm -hmm. I think, or mm -hmm. uh, identification office, um, she realized, I also understand these questions mm -hmm. and I can answer them. And the cool thing about Lupita's story is that that was the first domino pushed mm -hmm. because literally over the course of the next few weeks, she went and checked off other like government entity things that she needed to be doing that she had been putting on the back burner. Mm -hmm. um, and so just to see that empowerment, um, I mean, man, it's beautiful. And mm -hmm. it's it's literally why, I mean, why we do what we do, sure. right? Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> well, I, I resonate with that. 32 years ago, my wife and I moved to Poland as missionaries. And I remember having to learn a language and being frightened mm -hmm. in government offices. So, yeah, I can relate. Yeah, yeah. That, that's great. You mentioned COVID. I know with uh, attack poverty, it's like you guys just exploded mm -hmm. 10x or something uh, as far as the, uh, the folks that you were able to touch. I mean, mm -hmm. tell us how that transpired when most were closing down. You guys were like tooling up. Yeah, so it and it can be a touchy subject too of at that moment I think we really had to um I guess define what we are mm -hmm. what our mission and vision is. Um we always say it's about the hand up not the hand out. So mm -hmm. when COVID happened it was like well, we have to we have to provide for these right. communities, right? We can't just sit here and and watch them not be able to leave their homes and get food mm -hmm. or not provide anything right mm -hmm. and so we we struggled with that a little bit of the hand up versus the handout but we found a lot of different ways that we could incorporate both and what we've learned is you can never just take all the transaction away from empowerment right. Right. that it sometimes does need to start there yeah. so that people can just get get that stress off of them to be able to focus on right. those other things and so we pivoted really quickly mm -hmm. and we just started reaching out. We got Houston Food Bank second mile and 
um, a few other partners that really supplied all that food. And we just started doing weekly distributions. And some, at some locations, we did biweekly distributions mm -hmm. um, where we were serving over 500 families every distribution. And through that, we had a prayer tent every single time. Right. And we wouldn't actually just advertise that. We would just set it up. Yeah. And before we knew it by that, you know, that first month in, we always had a line around the corner, just as long as people waiting for food were just waiting for spiritual mm -hmm. care in that way. Sure. And so that was the way we tied that hand up with the hand out mm -hmm. of like, you're not just getting food from us. Us. We actually care about you. We're going to follow up with you and we want to know what else we can do mm -hmm. for you. Um, so, yeah, that and I think the word just kind of got out and we just start, we, and we just responded to whoever needed our help. And I think we just kept our heads down, kept working and then suddenly looked up and we're like, oh, <laughs> This is what we've done, right? Yeah. And it was just moving and moving and trying to meet people where they're at. Sure. And I think that, you know, desire of intentionality mm -hmm. has continued even mm -hmm. in, you know, uh, post COVID. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we call it that, but sure. even has continued over into current day in the sense of we still, even while we're meeting basic needs in a food distribution, we're still looking for opportunities to use that as an mm -hmm. on ramp or a, a, an initial touch point right. with mm -hmm. intentionality. Exactly. And so even now when we do a food distribution, we take all of those, you know, registration forms and whatever location mm -hmm. uh, that food distribution was at that next week, that location staff is making phone calls right. and following mm -hmm. up and seeing what else can we do to, again, help attack the poverty in your individual life, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. In fact, when we launched two and a half years ago, uh, City Rise, Missouri City, Attack mm -hmm. Poverty set up for us a food distribution every mm -hmm. Thursday. And uh, for a while, we were running 30 to 40% of those who came through would stop for prayer. We just had yeah. a sign, need mm -hmm. prayer. Uh, there was no coercion there. And <laughs> even, I mean, looking, and to me, this is the genius of such a, a, a relationship is we've actually found another supplier. Mm -hmm. And so Attack Poverty does not supply the food. They just help us set up. And so now they can actually mm -hmm. help the next right. uh, place start, uh, which actually also touches UCAN Academy out mm -hmm. on our campus. I know the this podcast will be probably in the fall of 2023. But in uh, the spring, uh, just in the month of May, mm -hmm. actually, uh, as we're conducting this, we have launched UCAN Academy at our campus two days under our belt, mm -hmm. day number three, Today, I'd love to hear you. I mean, I'll tell you my perspective is we're thrilled to have 20 uh, kids already enrolled, especially when you look at the last month of a school mm -hmm. year yeah. when the educational part is kind of slacking off. Mm -hmm. But uh, to see the kids show up, ask intelligent questions during Bible story, to engage, mm -hmm. um, almost all of them, they come in, they run, they grab a snack, they go in the gym, and uh, they just want to to be there with their peers mm -hmm. and they interact with the adults, yeah. which uh, doesn't always happen in, in the community where I serve. But what are your guys' impressions? Man, I, I really have been blown away these past two days. I, I left yesterday and I was telling, I was like, I just feel so honored to be able to be a part of this and watch this kind of unfold before me. Um, and Anna Rosa has been doing an amazing job and I've been just kind of off to the side trying to let her mm -hmm. lead in, in what she thinks is best for mm -hmm. the community. And yes, you're right. So what I love what you said was as the school is winding down. So actually our other location, UCAN Academies are ending. Yeah. And so we usually do end it already. And so I was like, this is going to be really interesting. Sure. Um, we usually focus on homework help, but they don't have homework. So what are, what are we going to do? Yeah. And especially after like star testing. Yes, and, stuff, and, yeah. and that's what I've been worried about too, is like, are they going to like, can they even focus when they get here after <laughs> being on testing yeah. all day? And, but what you said in it's like, wow, they really have been engaging mm -hmm. even more. And it actually almost seems like a benefit because they not focusing as much in class on a right. normal day. But then they come to us and they've been knocking out that reading and math so quickly. Mm -hmm. We've run out of activities. And um, and just seeing the volunteers um, that have surrounded mm -hmm. them. Um, so what, there's six volunteers. So there's eight adults there for right. these 17, 20 kids. And it's been so cool to see that high ratio because mm -hmm. I've loved just looking around and seeing those one-on-one -on -one conversations happening, not even yeah. about school, but they're just happening about life. Mm -hmm. And we see that mentorship yeah. um, really come into the program and come to yeah. life. And even then on the parent side, it's been amazing to see how dedicated and involved these parents mm -hmm. are. And, and already talking to Anna Rosa about 
okay, so I'm going to focus on the computer work at home. If you can just knock out that blue folder and it's like building this teamwork to right. really benefit the child right. and get yeah. them to where they need to be. Yeah. yeah. I think too, I mean, um, to see the beauty of this like holistic approach to the mm. health of the kiddo, um, take root and, and really be birthed, I think is a really beautiful thing because the reality is, is that so much of, um, of poverty and, and educational struggles, specifically in early childhood education in primary and elementary, um, a lot of that can be, it, most of the time it is tied back to trauma mm -hmm. in some way. And so to be able to watch these mentorship right. relationships take root, like, under the guise mm -hmm. of an after school tutoring program mm -hmm. is really, really beautiful. And I, what I'll comment on, um, <clears throat> is just to brag on you guys mm -hmm. for a little while. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm going to brag on you with the intention of making this, uh, a challenge to the other <laughs> pastors and churches that will be listening mm -hmm. to this is, um, you guys have been just unbelievable partners, mm -hmm. meaning, you guys have done the heavy lifting of building the relational work in your community mm -hmm. so that we can come in and not many people know attack poverty necessarily, but they know City Rise mm -hmm. in their community. Yeah. And so they're saying, if City Rise is a part mm -hmm. of it, then we trust it. And mm -hmm. that makes our job so much sure. easier. And so I say that to say, so many times pastors are like, how can I help my community? Like, do I need to mobilize a team of volunteers to to paint a house or to do this or to do that. And that's all good work and mm -hmm. action does need to happen. But honestly, the first step you need to do is get to know the community that you're in, listen, ask questions, and then do a lot of active listening. Yeah. And then it makes it so much easier to know the mm -hmm. focus and the direction to mobilize your congregation. And then it makes it easier to know the organizations you need to partner sure. with. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so mm -hmm. that to me has been one of the most beautiful things of this launching you can at City Rise, yeah. Missouri City. And really the reason I think it's been so successful yeah, for in sure. these two days yeah. <laughs> that I know yeah. it's going to be so much uh, better and, yeah. in the fall. Yeah, sure. it's be awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been fun even during the Bible stories. Uh, mm -hmm. I've heard everything. I've been in ministry a long time, <laughs> but I've never heard a boy ask about creation. Was that the 1950s? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, it's a little before then, but uh, yeah. Yeah. My son asked something the other day about 30 years ago, and I said, yeah, I mean, I, I was like in the 70s, and he was like, no, that was like 93. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, it, was, it was just a moment. I'm like, I was like, what are you talking about right now? Yeah. Anyway, but yeah. <laughs> so if there is a, a, a listener here, there's a, hey, our church could do a UCAN Academy. I mean, what steps, what would you guys look for? Uh, and how would they best prepare for the possibility? Yeah, so I think my first question would, or my first question, my first action would be um, obviously sitting down with that church and um, asking them some questions to kind of drill down into what kind of community listening have mm -hmm. you guys done? Because mm -hmm. sometimes we assume mm -hmm. that we know what our community right. needs. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is that this community, the people of peace, the yeah. community stakeholders, um, the residents of that community are best gonna know what that community mm -hmm. needs. And so we've actually even partnered um, with churches in the past that the initial conversation started with, hey, we wanna focus on this one program. Mm -hmm. And as we've kind of dug deeper, we found out, well, actually your community really needs this program. Right. So for mm -hmm. instance, um, a great example of that is we partnered with a church um, that was interested in a UCAN. Um, and so one of the things we challenged them with is to do a go door to door and do a community right. listening. And they found out that out of 16 out of the 20 houses that they went and knocked on the door and asked some questions and introduced themselves, 16 out of those 20 houses, um, the one of one or not more of the adults in that house did not have a GED or a high school equivalent. So to me, mm -hmm. um, I'm like, well, that's, that's really where maybe sure. we should start. Um, and so, so that really would be what my, my biggest thing would be is know exactly, first of all, really what the biggest need of your community is. If you decide it is a, you can, um, then reach out to attack poverty because we do it really well. Sure. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll help walk you through the steps of how to get that going and successfully, successfully launched. Mm -hmm. We, we, we would love to do that if it fits. So. All right. Well, great. It's been great having you guys. I always ask my last question. What should I have asked? What, what would you want our listeners to hear that you haven't been able to share? That's a great question. <laughs> what should you have asked? 
Um, put us on the spot. Like I, that. yeah. I mean, I th- honestly, I think it kind of hits on what I said last time is what, what should you have asked is what should be the first step mm. in engaging my community? Mm-hmm. And it's listening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's listening and it's taking the time to maybe to do the work that isn't always the most fun PR, mm-hmm. like isn't doesn't always make the best Instagram post, but you know without a shadow of a doubt that you are linking arms with those most invested in the community that you're in and you are meeting a need that's already going to have ownership in it. Mm-hmm. So maybe speed bumps installed mm-hmm. in a community isn't the most exhilarating work but you team up with community members and you make that mm-hmm. happen and you earn trust mm-hmm. and that leads to other work. Sure. And then that's where the empowerment will come from. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. Well, super. We're great to have you ladies. Great to have all of you that joined us on our city rise podcast and uh, hope to see you soon. God bless. Mm-hmm.